So we're in public session. Excellent. Uh, uh, I think the only apology I have at the moment is Philip and understand Malaysia. You've got um, Philip's uh, proxy, have you? Yeah. Yeah. And I've also seen an email from Matthew saying he might be a bit late coming through as well. As will Paul. <coughs> as will Paul. Uh, as Paul through. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. Uh, anybody? Any declarations of interest to make? Uh, moving on to chairperson's business, uh, social value in procurement. Matthew was attending the uh, workshop this morning. If Matthew comes in later, I might ask him just to give us a quick brief on what happened in the workshop. And uh, after Matthew's given us some information, but I would also think the committee, if it's content to write to the department, ask to share relevant papers from the event if we're agreed on that. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings the 28th of April. Draft minutes of the meeting are at page 7. Uh, minutes are content, are content with these. Minutes are an accurate record. Say agreed. 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 Matters arising at last week's meeting, members considered correspondence from the department, including the February <coughs> budget outturn and the March projections. Are members content to share this information with RAISE in order to inform its scrutiny of budget matters? Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay. If we can now ask, can I have uh, Scott Cameron, please, to come <coughs> up in the spotlight, please? <coughs> Hi, Scott. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good afternoon. Excellent. We've got the wonder, the wonders of long distance communications, or whatever it happens to be, and all the rest of it. Uh, team. Uh, this uh, uh, session is on, the organ uh, it's on OECD's view on fiscal council options. This is in the first of series of oral evidence sessions scheduled by the committee that will inform its deliberations on the future role for an independent fiscal council and any associated forthcoming legislation. First up, we'll start Cameron, who's Scott Cameron, who's the policy analyst for OECD. I would just like to remind everybody that the session is recorded in Hansard. The clerk's cover notice at page 16. OECD's written submission is page 21, and OECD briefing, briefing note on information for independent fiscal institutions is page 39, and a 2019 OECD review of the Scottish Fiscal Commission is page 61. Scott, can I ask you to make a, an opening statement, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, good afternoon, and thanks for having me. I always uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about fiscal councils. Um, so I myself spent seven years at the Canadian Parliamentary Budget Office, and I've helped set up similar institutions in Europe and in Asia. Uh, but now I'm coordinating the OECD network for independent fiscal institutions. And we have around 40 of these in our network, and we hope to welcome uh, Northern Ireland's council in the near future. We've reserved a seat next to them uh, beside the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So our network promotes and monitors the implementation of the OECD principles for IFIs, which I've uh, seen you've included in the Council's terms of reference. It's good to see. And uh, OECD members are expected to implement those principles when designing their fiscal councils. Um, but of course, we recognize that every jurisdiction is unique and you need to design the institution that works best for you. So uh, one of our network's main activities is to conduct external reviews of fiscal councils. And uh, during those reviews, we've seen a common set of lessons emerge. Uh, these issues come up over and over again. And if you're able to address them from the beginning, then you can spare yourselves a real headache later. So the first lesson is that, uh, and these are from my written submission. Uh, the first lesson is that these fiscal councils are generally usually small institutions. And the Secretariat may end up having only a handful of analysts. So even though you've said it will be technically a standalone body, there's a temptation to attach it to a larger organization like an Auditor General's office that will provide shared services like HR and IT. Now, they really should be out on their own, like the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Uh, but if you do attach it to a larger organization, you should make sure that there are clear walls surrounding it to guarantee analytical and operational independence. Uh, that's to protect both of them, really. Uh, fiscal Council tends to wade into more controversial policy commentary than other public bodies, and that can lead to tension and conflicts between the two, and less clear lines are drawn between them. Uh, so the second lesson, the Chair of the Council should really be at least a part-time position and ideally a full-time position. Now, uh, Northern Ireland's small, your population's small, it's a small public sector. so. 
If you don't think part-time is necessary, then at least be very specific with the expected commitments so that the chair and the council members can clarify arrangements with their outside employers. Uh, you may call in a professor from the university for the council or to be the chair, telling them it will only be a few hours a week or a few hours a month even. And it ends up being very more and or a lot more. And then the university doesn't reduce their other responsibilities and they have a very unpleasant work-life balance. So as you know, your temporary chair, Mr. Choate, Sir Choate, uh, was full time at the OBR and enjoyed a long, impactful tenure. Uh, so down in the Republic of Ireland, uh, with part-time chairs, they've struggled with that balance. Yeah. Uh, the third lesson, the law should clearly define the council's role in serving the assembly and designate specific points in the budget cycle to do so. Um, so this might include appearing twice a year in the spring and the fall in front of the finance committee, provide an opinion on the economy and public finances, or to discuss the sustainability report. Um, if that interaction isn't explicit in the law or other rules of procedure, we find that the committees and councils just don't interact as often as we'd like to see. Lesson four, the legislation should explicitly grant the IFI the right to publish self-initiated work. So um, if the council is confined to one assessment report or a sustainability report a year, then you know, what if an urgent issue comes up in the summer? Uh, and sometimes the ability to publish self-initiated work is intended by the designers of the council, but they leave it as a gray area in law, which then the um, government is able to challenge whether certain reports should be coming out. So you should be clear with that power if you intend it. Uh, lesson five, on access to information, you should give the council a specific resolution in the event the department doesn't comply with an information request. So the most common resolution mechanism is that the council can come to you, the finance committee, or the speaker assembly with a complaint, and then assembly members can use your powers to compel the government to hand over the information. Um, also be very specific defining the circumstances by which the government can decline an information request. So, uh, for example, the United States Congressional Budget Office for information requests that can only be declined if fulfilling the request would break another law. So then the onus is on the government to point to which law that that would contravene. Lesson six, the uh, council needs a sustainable secretariat, and that means enough analysts to provide an ongoing institutional memory and analytical capacity to make the council's views coherent and consistent over time. So some councils were set up with the idea that uh, council members would do the analysis themselves. That led to very personality and opinion driven assessments that changed over time and weren't consistent uh, when council members left. So the council should really be there for quality control and to be the public face of the secretariat's work. Uh, lesson seven, the final lesson is the council should have full ownership of its communications. So the ability to communicate publicly is the key to the council's influence. Uh, ministers don't necessarily care what an economist says unless it shows up in a headline on their desk in the morning. Um, so we've had small councils outsource their communications to contractors that didn't really understand the work. We've had councils in large organizations with a communications office that would filter their voice. The uh, council and secretariat really need their own voice. Um, so that's, that concludes the lessons. Uh, we have lots to cover on options for mandates, leadership appointment, uh, resources, access to information, all of those areas. So I'll hand it back to the chair and we can get on with it. Okay. Thanks very much. Look, to us, the key to this is the, the first word of it. It's independent. And I don't know how much you've been following sort of Northern Ireland's travails, particularly over um, various issues, along with scandals and bits, other sort of issues. It, that is one of the main issues we have been asking for, and sort of declaration of interest. I'm the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, but we have been asking for this for at least a decade that we would have an independent fiscal council of some description to do some degree of oversight in what we're doing. But one of the biggest issues that we have is everything you've outlined in your seven points. It's a reason why we need to have that degree of independence to be able to do that as well. But it's noteworthy you said about the size of Northern Ireland, but yet we have a, I think our last figures, we're looking at sort of a 13 billion budget. Uh, so, whereas we, you know, we may be small in numbers of about 1.8 million at uh, 13 billion, you can actually see that there is a sizable heft of a, a budget, and sort of the look and management of that as well as well. But looking at that and bearing in mind sort of some of the issues to do now with sort of uh, 
the movement of powers towards regional administrations and particularly uh, with what happens in the Scottish and Welsh model and the rest of it. Can you, sorry, you've identified there sort of your seven, your seven key points, but has there been anything you've seen over the last couple of years that has stood out in particular that we must make sure that we do right, right from the beginning? And just for instance, one of the questions we're having at the moment is, you know, do we put the independent fiscal council on a statutory basis? And you know, I think that is the first question we need to need to ask, and I would be I'd be delighted to hear your views and opinions on that. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Um, so right off the bat, with your last issue there, um, obviously you don't have a constitution per se, which would be the strongest way to implement this and ensure its independence. But uh, that's very rare, even for those countries that do have a constitution. So, um, no primary legislation is uh, where we see this most often, and where we recommend that it is uh, is created and outlined. So, I think eighty four percent of these councils are, um, are are created within primary legislation. And then, yeah, constitutional is very rare, about 10%. And then also about uh, 10% is some of the legislative uh, budget offices, like PBOs. They may be created with standing orders or um, internal rules and procedures of the parliament. Uh, but obviously, uh, standalone legislation is what you'd like. And you want to, where we've seen some specific Specific concerns in early years are uh, budget disputes where they tend to be created during term, tumultuous times, like it sounds like you may have here, where there's it, the global financial crisis, for example, where um, governments are facing cutbacks generally, but also there's been threats to budgets early on. So if you can also enshrine in that statutory legislation the uh, uh, budget guarantee, and that's difficult to do in statutes, but um, you can set, for example, down in the Republic of Ireland, they gave it a baseline right in that legislation. And then um, ideally you would then grow that with inflation over time, something to put a floor on that budget so that the government doesn't have the ability to cut them and effectively silence them by reducing their resources. Um, on independence also, uh, we've seen in the early years, especially these offices set up within the Ministry of Finance and um, down in the UK Treasury. I know I remember I was there the first year of the OBR when they stuck a piece of paper on the door of the former macro team saying this is now the OBR. Um, those arrangements can work. Uh, these offices are generally very keen to be independent and the analysts, the public servants are almost the most uh, willing to start um, you know, criticizing the way things are done and give that independent voice that they've always wanted to give. So that can work, but ideally we would not want to see it attached within the, to the Ministry of Finance, especially in the kind of early years when they need to set the public perception of their independence. Yep, thanks. Jim? Um, have you any experience of an Office of Budget Responsibility or Fiscal Council? being set up in an administration who basically has really no tax raising powers. Um, when you actually looked at the Northern Ireland budget, it's very different from maybe any other one you'll see, because apart from the regional rate and bits and pieces like car tax and planning fees and things like that, we really haven't got an awful lot of money coming in directly under our control. Can you have a proper fiscal council, OBR, if you don't have control of both levers of the economy? Hmm. Um, the work of a council where obviously the government has complete discretion over all of their finance, there's a lot more to do and a bigger role to play. But um, there's just as an important role in your situation because that um, fiscal envelope is fixed, you know, uh, whether there are explicit fiscal rules or not. And I believe you're like Scotland in that you can borrow a little bit for capital expenses yep. or there's yeah. rules rules in that extent, but that's that's all the more important to have these councils um, checking the government's planning assumptions to make sure that they're reasonable so that you don't run afoul of those rules or those effective constraints so that 
know, three quarters of the way through the year, you're all of a sudden you've exhausted your spending envelope and you um, can't raise revenue, you're bound by that, and then you have to cut uh, public services effectively. So there is very much a role for it, and the role is up to you. They can simply be checking the government's um, assumptions or, as they've done in Scotland, if you have concerns over the planning uh, forecasts, over planning assumptions, then you can bring some of those out of the um, government's uh, discretion and give them to the council to do. Yes, but I mean, of course, it would ne never happen here that we ever be above budget or uh, out of kilter with our allocation. That would be impossible. But um, if, if it's transpired that the finance department are taking a solo run and leading us into disaster, what would you recommend would be the powers for the council or the Office of Budget Responsibility, or whatever we call it, at what, at what level would you give them the power to intervene in that situation? Mm. Um, when these councils were first discussed, and uh, particularly during the global financial crisis and in the EU framework, the kind of the academic idea was that you would take a lot of the control away from the government and by default to parliament as well and give it to these councils in the way that we've done that for monetary policy but of course that is you know democratically fundamentally that's the government's prerogative and and um and you're there to do the official oversight or scrutiny of the government's plans so what we've found and what we recommend actually is that the role of these councils is not to take control away from you or the government really to increase transparency and make sure that you're getting the right information to do your job and to have the subject matter expertise to examine the government's assumptions and to really um, bring that information and any causes for concerns to light to you directly and that's why it's so important to have something um, ingrained in the legislation that they come to you and tell you their findings and um, other than that, like I said, you can you can bring some of the uh, assumptions for uh, planning out some of the uh, spending forecasts. Uh, I know sometimes governments are too optimistic on health spending. Uh, that's a problem down in the Republic of Ireland, I know. So you could bring some of the planning assumptions to the to the council's um, ability or require them to do it. But in terms of binding teeth, like making governments um, halfway through the year change their plans. We don't see that in the councils, but uh, hopefully they can bring things like that to your attention and you can take action with whatever powers you have, which you know often aren't much, unfortunately, for legislators. Does the three dreaded letters RHI mean anything to you? Um, is that the, this <sighs> indexation and inflation a mess that they have if only if, if only it was something as minor as that the RHI's renewable heating incentive which was a scheme that basically brought this assembly down for three years and you okay. know created absolute chaos it's a scheme that ran completely out of control and threatened yep. frankly to bankrupt northern ireland so you're saying should there be a repeat of that type of uh, scandal that you don't believe that the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility or the Fiscal Council would have a right to intervene and put the brakes on that. All they could do would be to highlight and provide information on it. Um, I, I'm not familiar with any, any examples where the council would have that uh, control or authority. Now, um, you could have legislation that says if the council gives an adverse opinion on the budget, then they have to go back uh, to the drawing board. Um, so there's an endorsement function you could have the council um, perform. So they scrutinize the budget and then they're required to endorse it before it um, goes out, before it comes to you to approve. Um, so that, that's an option you could do. And hopefully they would take a look at the RHI problem and say, the assumptions that you've made in your budget. Now they can't necessarily comment on the policy, whether it's a good policy or, or not, but they could they could comment on whether the government has presented it um, accurately, transparently, whether they've misrepre misrepresented it. And if they think that the government has not done so, then they could uh, decline endorsing the budget. And then either it goes out without an endorsement and people know that and you know that, or it has to go back to the drawing board and they have to fix the changes before it comes to you. 
And finally, uh, you've been very, very generous with your time. Um, we are the same size as, as Estonia, just as an example in terms of population, though I think mm -hmm. our budget would be bigger than theirs. And, but um, at what size of an economy do you think it's appropriate to have full-time uh, Office of uh, Budget Responsibility? What, what, where do you pitch? I mean, from your experience, like, do, in, for instance, in Canada, does Nova Scotia or Newfoundland have their own regional? Yeah. Uh, at, what, what, at what level do you pitch full-time staffing? And, and um, so, uh, Nova Scotia doesn't have such a body yet, and of course they're quite small, but Ontario, which is a big economy, they have, they have their own uh, full-time parliamentary budget officer, and Quebec has just done so. Um, that's a really difficult question. Most of the European Union Council members are not full-time and not even technically part-time, although many of them do commit uh, part-time to it. So uh, we're doing a review now where the um, essentially it requires a, ret a retired chair to, of this council and the um, and that's who's fulfilling it right now because it's a lot of work and a lot of press engagement, media engagement at the drop of a hat and essentially a somebody with a full-time job could not serve in that role. So it's not fair to them, it's not fair to the kind of the council as an idea um, so, but a lot of it has to do, depends on the mandate. So what you want them to be doing, if uh, as your terms of reference say, it's two reports a year, an assessment report, a sustainability report that may not be every year, might be every couple of years. Um, it really depends on what you want this council to be and how, how much authority you want to give them and, and their roles. So if you want them to be doing policy costing, independent policy costing of spending programs, then it's going to be you know, much more geared to a full-time role. Uh, it depends on their relationship with the government and how much the government is willing to cooperate. So um, if the government opens their books and says, come on in, then you don't need a, a lot of uh, staff or a full-time chair for that. Uh, you just need somebody to go in a couple of times a year and uh, go through the books and sign off on them. But that never happens essentially. Um, so that's not, uh, you need a, a kind of, uh, surveillance is a full-time job. Um, now if you have a strong secretariat and a strong head of secretariat that can replace the council members. Um, but uh, it's, it's really what you envision the office to be, the council to be, and their mandate that's going to determine that. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Siri. Jim? Jim Allister? Yeah, thanks for your very informative um, uh, paper. One of the things that interests me is what background are you looking for in members of a fiscal council? I ask that because the interim council that has been appointed, it seems to be exclusively comprised of economists, whereas I would have expected people with public expenditure experience to be key. Have you any view of that? Um, yes, I can give you uh, exact statistics, I believe so. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, you're right that uh, it's a lot of academic economists. So in these councils around Europe, we have 63% of the council members are from universities. 34% uh, are from central banks. Um, 30% from Ministry of Finance. Uh, it's, um, it's, these are kind of like, uh, they don't add up to 100. It's, it's kind of the past um, uh, appointments. But uh, so there, there's lots of ways you can look at it. It's good to know how the sausage is made. So if you find somebody that's from Ministry of Finance and knows where the uh, bodies are buried, et cetera, then it's, um, that can be very good. Now that's not necess necessary. Sometimes it's good to have these out perspectives and bring new kind of ideas and oversight onto the council. Um, in terms of, yeah, economics versus other social sciences versus practical experience, I think you're right. Um, it's, it, economists are very, very uh, overrepresented on these councils. And um, if the Republic of Ireland has had that discussion and we um, talked to a lot of uh, stakeholders that said, and they're starting to move towards that, why not? get some more um, diverse uh, backgrounds, people that are into, you know, social welfare programs um, and uh, the people that have experience with labor unions, with all kinds of different um, 
representatives of the people in, in the uh, Northern Ireland um, uh, society. Now, uh, you will have to kind of um, bring people in, and that will come down to the appointment process and the shortlist process. Um, I can speak to that as well. You can have, uh, uh, do I have a time limit on these responses? Or we... No, no. No. Um, so ultimately it's, you know, who you want on this council is gonna be up to whoever is appointing them. And there are kind of four aspects to the appointment process. There are, uh, there's a short listing and nomination phase. There is the kind of selection from that short list phase and then the appointment and the, sometimes there's secondary approvement of the appointment. So usually it's appointed by the executive and then the secondary approvement is from the committees or from the parliamentary assembly. But that initial shortlisting and selection of candidates, uh, that can be put in the hands of the, um, the assembly to come up with that list. It can be, we like to see open competitions uh, for that uh, nomination process, shortlisting process. You could um, ask different stakeholders. Some countries say uh, all kinds of uh, stakeholders can appoint somebody to the board. So um, the, uh, for example, the Auditor General can have an appointment for one of the chairs on the council. And um, you could, the Central Bank could have one. So maybe that's going to get you more economists, but maybe the Auditor General selection will get you a, um, an accountant, which often some of these places are missing, somebody who really knows public sector accounting, um, things like that. But no, I'd say I think certainly we're starting to move more towards generally uh, representing more diverse interests on these councils. But it is a very express knowledge of public accounting practices not vital if you're going to mark the homework of the Department of Finance? Because we have a budgetary arrangement which is quite opaque mm -hmm. in that, for example, the figures that you're given to various disciplines or departments are just so wide without any breakdown that it's very hard to know what to make of them. For example, we spend two billion in education, but there's no breakdown of much of that's for preschool, how much is for uh, yep. primary, how much is whatever. And that of course suits departments. They can simply shuffle it around as they want, but it doesn't do anything for public transparency or accountability. And I would have thought you need people with some nice about public expenditure to be able to drill down and see uh, why certain things aren't and aren't provided for. And also, you know, surely a function of a fiscal council is also to visit the issue of efficiencies. And um, you know, in our current budget, I read nothing about, effic about efficiencies. Um, all of which I think underscores the point you made about the primary necessity being for independence. No point in having nodding dogs on mm. this. Uh, uh, and therefore that takes you to the key issue of who appoints them. So I think a fiscal council needs to be an effective machine, not just a rubber stamping operation. And it's how you get mm -hmm. to being an effective machine rather than a mere rubber stamp or cover for government. That mm -hmm. surely is the critical issue. Yep, um, I have a couple of points I can quickly make on that. I should say that the OECD principles do say that um, the technical skills and expertise should be specified in legislation. So as you're drafting this, if you think that for Northern Ireland's case, you really need something with uh, that kind of background in, in accounting, um, you could specify that at least one council member has to have uh, an accounting background. Um, speaking personally, I uh, was, uh, I did university in economics, grad school in economics, and the first couple of years on the job, I, I got a lot of uh, public accounting experience and courses on that. And I've found the accounting experience is probably much more invaluable to the role um, than, than some of the ec economics I learned. It's, it's very important. Um, and then to your point about efficiencies, there are, especially in small countries where the um, population of analysts or of candidates for these roles uh, isn't large from the economics sphere. You do see um, business leaders appointed to the board. Um, so that could kind of hit that area. You could have industry representatives. Um, and uh, so it's really up to you uh, 
what kind of background, but you should include in legislation specifically that they have to have expertise in the area of public finance, economics, or accounting, if you um, see, see fit for that. So final question, if you were on this council or chaired this council, what would be your first 100 days objective? <laughs> that's, that's a good one. Um, let me see. I'd have to be careful about any. Uh, that, that's a very personal question, I think. But in the in the past, again, it's um, establishing an identity for themselves as independent. And so some leaders have said uh, kind of like if when you're, um, you know, if you're if you're put in prison, you should pick a fight and prove yourself uh, strong right at the beginning. Um, that is one approach. I don't know if that is a good approach, but you can, some have chosen to demonstrate their opinion by, or their independence by coming in very strong at the beginning. That's an option. Others have been more about building relationships for, with the government and that you can maintain your independence and nonpartisanship and all of that good stuff by, but while forming useful re relationships with governments, you're going to have to work with these governments. You're going to need information access. You're going to need relationships with them. So if you come in and, and you pick fights, you, sometimes you can burn those bridges that you're going to need to do your job. So um, come in and get a uh, good talent to work for you, um, a good a good staff, uh, set up these reports and do a good job with the reports. The reports are, they speak for themselves. And then if anybody has uh, criticisms of the council, um, it can get politicized, especially early on. And if anybody dismisses the analysis as partisan or dismisses it as not independent, then if your reports are solid, you say, point to where in the report that this is partisan or not independent. And if they can't, the, the report should speak for themselves. So it's really about making sure that analysis in the first um, 100 days, the first year is really solid so that you build your reputation um, for that your office will coast on for the rest of the years. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Pat? Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Scott. And I'm no expert on this at all, but you, you did say earlier on you used the word who appoints. I mean, in Northern mm. Ireland politics, uh, as the working as I see, I could change a point to anoint, anoints, anoints. So how do you make sure that you have that person uh, which is completely independent? And you did say something earlier on about can we get that role? Is there a possibility? Are you familiar with, with, with our assembly that we can hold that on the floor of the assembly? Um, I didn't quite catch that last one. So, well, you so said... as we, uh, is there a way that we can get ownership of it by ourselves yeah. as, as a group of 90 rather than setting it into one individual de department or, for want of a better word, the executive itself? Um, yes, absolutely. So there are models of these councils, which um, uh, particularly the parliamentary budget offices, which are have a much closer relationship with the legislature. And if that's your the service that you want, and you want to be able to submit requests yourself to the council and have them be obligated to reply to you, to respond to you, then you could absolutely set these up with a much closer relationship with the legislature or um, even attached to the Secretariat of the Legislature, as well, long as, again, you have these walls of operational independence. Um, but if, if you're looking for more of a, of a council that is legislative, legislature-facing, uh, assembly-facing, then you could specify that in the legislation. Um, and then another way, as you hinted at there, with the nomination and appointment process is you could have... Um, when you're setting this legislation, you could have the uh, shortlisting um, be approved or come by an independent process. You could have uh, an independent <laughs> firm go out and find candidates, and then you yourselves, the assembly, um, uh, approve it. You can. There, I've seen models where. Um, opposition parties and backbenchers get to approve one council member. Um, but really it's about clarifying the uh, expertise in the legislation so that you don't get a purely political appointment. They need that background. Um, even when governments of the day and uh, 
get that appointment themselves, they've been very good about appointing credible independent um, voices to the councils, uh, even if it's against their interest. You know, it's they know it's going to make nasty headlines and the assembly is going to get very upset if they appoint an obvious partisan. So they're very good with it. But then uh, you can specify in the legislation whether uh, the assembly gets final approval, um, whether you do the appointing yourselves or the committee, perhaps the committee of finance could have final sign off on these um, appointees. Uh, so that is when you're crafting the legislation, keep that in mind. Um, and you can set up terms of reference in designing the legislation so that, um, you know, the government doesn't uh, craft it the way it wants to. I'm, I'm not familiar with your current statistics in terms of representation in the, in the assembly, but um, you'll want to design the legislation to keep those points in mind. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. Alicia? Hello, Hello Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Fajr, you're very welcome here this afternoon and thank you for your presentation to date. Uh, like yourself, um, I actually graduated in economics as well and taught accounts. Uh, and yet, notwithstanding that, uh, I still find the budget bill and main estimates and the likes of it very, very difficult to get my head around at times and that. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of uh, a fiscal council, would you see the fiscal council as having a role? Maybe uh, not just in terms of uh, their relationship with uh, the government departments and the likes of it, but with the general public as well, and actually uh, helping to keep them informed or educating them even, or presenting information to them in a language so that they could understand. I think that's a fantastic idea. And so um, as long as you empower them with, uh, you know, the ability to put, put self-initiate reports or explicitly in, in legislation, you can require them. So there's lots of options we can go into or I can submit later about these types of monitoring reports where, you know, the monthly financial statements, I don't know if they're coming out right now on an island, but the, the data is there. And even in cases where the government is publishing those monthly monitoring statistics, it might not be in a useful format or for people like yourselves to wrap your head around or the public to wrap their head around. So it's, it's simple work. It's easier than building economic, macroeconomic forecasting, forecasting models, but it's equally important to be able to compile all of this um, central revenue fund and, um, expenditure data and put it in a format that you can come to terms with very quickly you don't have a lot of time even though you have expertise you're you're busy so if they can come out with a quarterly expenditure monitoring report and if that's important for you for them to be doing that you can put that you can require that right in the legislation that four times a year they have to give you know a quarterly update on the uh, the spending plans or the spending realization that's terrific. Or if you um, give them enough staff in the secretariat to do this kind of work, and it will all need to be reflected by the resources you provide them. Um, as long as you give them power to self-initiate reports, then they'll probably on their own choose to do something like this, provide regular updates, as long as they have the resources to do it. If you know they only have a couple of staff and they have other obligations, then they might not get around to it. But if you require that report and give them the resources to do so, then absolutely, I think that's a good idea. Um, put them the power and the resources to do it on their own initiative without enshrining it in the uh, legislation. Okay, Karmaga, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Sir, thank you very much indeed for your evidence. So you mentioned you've got some examples of monthly monitoring um, statistics and monthly monitoring reports. Could you forward those mm -hmm. to, onto the committee, please? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. That'd be great. Yeah, that's something I think we would all appreciate if we were able to get yeah. to the point where we're able to do that as well. Scott, thank yeah. you very much indeed. And uh, please, uh, can we keep the links and dialogues open with the OECD and the rest of it? Because look, there is, uh, you've given us an awful lot of food for thought. And I think uh, just keeping uh, the communications open would be very useful. But thank you very much indeed for your evidence. And thanks very much indeed for your time today. Keep safe. Cheers. And, and thank you. It was a pleasure. And I'd be happy to keep those, uh, that dialogue going. Thanks. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next item on the agenda is Institute for Fiscal Studies Fiscal Council Options. Uh, the committee will now receive its second oral evidence of today for its consideration of the role of Independent Fiscal Council. Uh, can I bring up David Phillips, please, on Starleaf? Hi, David. Good afternoon. Excellent. Good. 
Uh, I'd just like to say the session has been recorded by Hansard. The following are relevant to this agenda item. The clerk's cover note at page 142, <coughs> ministerial correspondence at page 184, an excerpt from the IFS paper, the new fiscal framework on page 149, the IFS submission uh, 2019 to the Treasury Committee's inquiry on the impact of business rates and business on page 210. David, would you like to make your opening statement, please? Thank you. Uh, yes. So um, I guess what I can say is that the IFS, our work tends to focus more on fiscal rules and sort of fiscal outlook as opposed to fiscal institutions. Uh, but many of the sort of recommendations we've made prior to the setting up of the OBR around the independence of uh, the forecasting and the kind of data that needs to be provided um, to kind of show, you know, the sort of judgments made, the assumptions made, and the kind of credibility of those judgments were then ended up being taken up by the OBR. So we have got some uh, experience sort of in, in, in that field. Um, so in today's session, I'm happy to talk about my views and our views on issues related to you know, the, the sort of operation and remit of uh, the Fiscal Council. Uh, and also, um, I was asked if I could provide some information about business rates and business rates reform, and I can happy, happily talk about that as well. Yeah, delighted. Oh, yes, please. Yep. Sorry, I said delighted. <laughs> please, please talk. Oh, um, well, I, I was waiting for some sort of questions, actually, oh, rather than... Right, um, I haven't prepared a sort of speech in advance. I, usually when I do these things for either the Scottish Scottish Parliament, Welsh, Welsh Assembly, etc., there's sort of a list of questions. I hadn't been told to prepare a speech in advance. I'm sorry if, if that no, was that's, expected. No, that's fine. So are you ready for some questions then? Yep. <laughs> OK. Um, so one of the questions we have is, what, what benefit would a new fiscal body bring to the governance of Northern Ireland Executive of Finances? And also, uh, germane to that, Northern Ireland is a relatively small jurisdiction with very limited tax uh, varying powers. How could, we, uh, how could we assess and report of the sustainability of the executive's finance? And should this be delivered by a sub-office of the Northern Ireland Audit Office or a new research body? What do you think? So on that um, first stage, I think clearly um, the, the importance of an independent fiscal institution, uh, of a fiscal council of institution, uh, increases the greater the extent of, um, I guess, demand-led spending and the greater the extent of revenues that are devolved to a territory. Um, those typically are the sort of things where, um, you know, rather than you know, working to a fixed budget in advance, the amount of spending will depend on, for example, the number of claimants for the benefits, the revenues will depend on the performance of the economy and the tax bases. Uh, those things are uncertain. Um, in order to set budgets, you need to sort of, you know, produce forecasts and you want those forecasts um, to be credible and independent. So I think kind of the first thing I'd say is that clearly, you know, the, the extent, the importance and the resourcing that a fiscal council um, would, would need uh, will, will very much depend upon um, the, the range of powers and the, and the range of responsibilities uh, of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, in relation to, yes, demand-led welfare spending and um, uh, taxes. Now, as it stands at the moment, there are, you know, relatively, you know, uh, few um, uh, responsibilities in that area. Uh, welfare spending is formally devolved, but the way it's devolved is quite different to, for example, um, sort of the Scottish model for the element of welfare in Scotland. Uh, in Scotland, when they devolved welfare, um, they devolved the responsibility for funding that welfare as well. Even if policy remained the same, the Scottish government would bear the risks of uh, uh, the cost going up or down more or less quickly uh, than in the rest of the UK. Uh, the Northern Ireland uh, funding for, for welfare is not like that. Uh, Northern Ireland bears the cost of, of policy deviations, but you know, for, for a kind of common set of policies, the UK Treasury provides you know, the amount it costs to provide that. There's no sort of risk in the budget around if kind of costs, if, if, if the number of claimants go up or down uh, in a different way to the rest of the UK. So the welfare side, whilst, you know, there's quite a lot of devolved powers there in principle, the funding responsibilities uh, aren't, aren't, aren't there. So I think kind of in the sort of classic areas where, you know, the, the fiscal councils uh, in the UK, the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission, 
the only kind of real areas there, I think, would be um, the costs of any uh, deviations on the welfare policy uh, and how those might vary according to kind of claimant numbers. And then also on uh, the revenue side, there'd be um, business rates and um, uh, uh, domestic, um, the domestic rates, the sort of regional domestic rates. Um, so at the moment, it would be relatively small amounts under the sort of traditional sort of, you know, remits in the kind of UK context, at least, of these of these fiscal councils, which would probably suggest, you know, uh, a relatively small and focused body. Um, I think looking at the terms of reference, the terms of reference are uh, slightly different to, for example, the terms of reference um, for, for the Scottish um, Fiscal Commission. So um, I think the, the terms of reference that have been set out uh, for this um, relates very much to not only kind of, you know, the annual assessment of uh, the ex executives revenue streams, but also the sort of sustainability and the implications of spending policy and efficiency measures. Now, that isn't something that's been done. Well, actually, I think actually getting to the bottom of what this would mean exactly could be an important kind of question. Um, because, for example, the Scottish Fiscal Commission doesn't have at the moment any sort of um, longer term uh, assessment of fiscal sustainability uh, or spending outlook or revenues outlook. It's very much a kind of a, a medium term forecaster. The OBR does do a sort of long term fiscal sustainability report looking at, you know, the outlook for uh, health spending, pension spending, so on and so forth, revenues out for, I think it's 50 years. Now, it's not clear to me whether this is suggesting something along those lines you know, for the elements which are the responsibility of um, the Northern Irish executive. So I guess health and social care, mm -hmm. um, education and and potentially any devolved taxes, or whether this is like thinking about something kind of shorter term, um, you know, kind of, you know, more in the sort of medium term sustainability of the plans. Uh, because I think kind of looking at efficiency measures, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, the discussion of you know the effectiveness of long-term efficiency measures to me suggests something kind of a, a shorter horizon than that sort of 50-year horizon um, that the OBR has when it looks at, at a sort of long-term sustainability. And I think it is an interesting question about the extent to which an independent, you know, well, an institution that is involved in sort of forecasting and sort of long-term fiscal sustainability analysis should also be assessing the effectiveness of efficiency measures, mm -hmm. or whether that is something more for like an audit office, you know, for example, like the National Audit Office uh, may do that in, in, in a sort of UK government department context. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Pat? Thank you, and just staying on that point, um, we, we tend to, the budget process that often runs late to under delays, or people can blame it on from the Westminster government, but. In the event of Westminster Government or the Executive failing to provide budget information, might an independent fiscal council produce a kind of shadow budget, uh, which might inform the Executive of those decisions that so are outstanding? I think, I think that's a really interesting question. So uh, you may have noticed in the uh, Scottish um, budget this year, so the Scottish budget this year was published at the very end of January, mm -hmm. which was before the UK budget, although after the sort of uh, uh, autumn statement and, and um, 2020 spending round. Uh, and in that, um, the, the SFC, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, made its own um, forecasts of, you know, revenues um, for Scottish revenues, even though those would be affected by potentially, you know, decisions on the income tax personal allowance. For example, they, they said, well, we're going to assume that the income tax personal allowance follows standard indexation policy. In the end, they ended up um, announcing that actually from subsequent years, there'd be a freeze, um, but they, they can subsequently update their forecasts to take account for that. And then potentially more significant was not what the... Um, not what the Fiscal uh, Commission did, but what the Scottish Government did. When it set its budget, it assumed that there'd be, a, there'd be 500 million pounds more of additional uh, Barnet Formula consequentials um, that would be announced in the budget for 21-22. Um, and when it set its budgets, 
it, it built those in, you know, even despite those not being yet announced. Um, and I think that would have been a, a problem if those had not then been announced. Um, they'd have kind of cut, you know, because of the, the sort of balanced budget uh, rules that the devolved governments operate in. But I think that does provide, you know, the, the combination of what the SFC did on the forecasts, you know, provide initial set of forecasts based on default assumptions, which can be updated subsequently. Um, and what the Scottish government did in, you know, making its own assumptions, which were then assessed by the SFC as to their reasonableness or not. Um, that could provide a guide to how the Northern Irish executive and any Northern Irish fiscal council could operate uh, in such circumstances. Uh, I should also add that one of the things that will help deal with those circumstances is also um, the sort of financial flexibilities around borrowing. So, for example, if tax forecasts or block grant adjustment forecasts were to change, you know, once a budget had been set, the ability to borrow to offset that rather than having to sort of make in your cuts, I think that could be an important kind of aspect of, of, of dealing with those situations as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for coming and giving us evidence today, David. Um, can I just ask um, about, you, you talked about fiscal forecasting. Um, can I ask about your views on economic forecasting? Obviously, the OBR has a um, role under the Budget Responsibility Act of having a, it, it does an EFO, it does a, an economic and a fiscal forecast. Do you think it's uh, an, do you think it's important that economic forecasting be part of the be integrated with the fiscal forecast, as it were? Well, to the extent to which, you know, the economic forecasts are determinants of the fiscal forecast, yeah. you will need to have some economic forecasts that you are using um, in order to determine, you know, what you expect to happen to, I guess, at the moment, business rates and non -domestic, and domestic rates, and potentially if there's further tax devolution uh, or welfare devolution, uh, those items as well. So I think you need to have um, economic forecasts. I think there is an interesting question about do you need to have separate uh, forecasts? Um, so on the one hand, actually, actually on both the, the economic and the fiscal side of things, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Um, so you know, one option would be, for example, to use the OBR's economic forecasts and, and, and plug those into Northern Ireland fiscal forecasts. Um, that would mean that a common set of assumptions are being used around the um, the performance of the economy. Now, on the on the one hand, that might be considered well. Actually, if we had Northern Ireland specific forecasts for the economy as well as the public finances, it could take account of you know specific developments in the Northern Irish forecast in the Northern Irish economy that the OBR perhaps wouldn't have done. Um, that uh, we can build you know more bespoke models uh, to forecast or take account of the so economic variables that are most important for the taxes that are devolved for us, uh, whereas actually, you know, the OBR wouldn't spend much time, you know, actually forecasting some of these very uh, smaller uh, taxes. So that might push towards wanting to have set forecasts. You need to have forecasts. Having your own ones might mean they're sort of, if you like, you know, more bespoke, take out of more specific uh, things. On the other hand, though, one of the things you've seen in Scotland is that it's not just when there's differences in economic performance between Scotland and the rest of the UK that you can get, if you like, you know, divergences in revenues and then a need for reconciliations and either the Scottish government gets a bit more money than it's expecting or actually has to pay some back some, back some money that it, that it had previously forecast it was going to receive. It's not just differences in performance that are doing that, it's differences in the economic and, and fiscal forecasts. Because if you have two forecasts, two forecasters making different assumptions about what's going to happen to the economy, what's going to happen to revenues, that adds, if you like, another element of uncertainty, another element where actually things may differ. Now, in general, you'd expect if the OBR is going to forecast a you know, strong economy, probably other forecasters will, a Northern Irish forecaster will, but they're not going to perfectly align. And the, the sort of, the upshot of this is that when you have different forecasters, you know, one doing the Northern Irish uh, economic and fiscal forecasts, the OBR supposedly doing the UK ones, which will matter for any block grant adjustments that operate in this new uh, fiscal world. Um, 
you get you, you you can get sort of more volatility in this system, which again would mean a need for more fiscal flexibility around borrowing or reserves or other things to address that volatility. Um, so I think you know there's actually a bit of a trade-off here. Do you think that it will you know a a bespoke forecast for Northern Ireland will be significantly better, and therefore it's worth you know taking on that additional risk and volatility, or do we think that actually minimizing the risk and volatility, even if the forecasts are a little bit out, by having one common set of forecasts, you know, there's, there's a trade-off there. I'm not sure I completely follow the trade-off in that. Are you saying that producing our new fiscal council having a standalone responsibility to produce an economic for to produce a bespoke economic forecast for Northern Ireland? Builds in a degree of volatility, but if you, they are mandated yes. to so, to uh, to sorry, go on ahead. So let me explain it. So let's let's assume. So the way that that if there is further fiscal devolution, what would likely to be happen would yeah. you know there'd be some additional tax revenues that devolved to Northern Ireland, and then there'd be what's called a block grant adjustment. They take some money off the block grant to reflect that tax revenue that's been devolved. And what happens in Scotland, for example, is that the Scottish Fiscal Commission does the forecasts for the tax revenues that are devolved, but it's the OBR forecasts that matter for determining the uh, block grant adjustments and how they change over time. Now, what can happen then is that the economy might evolve in exactly the same way in Scotland as it does in the rest of the UK. But at the start of the year, the SFC potentially is a bit more bullish about the economy than it expects. Sorry, sorry not than it expects. The SFC is more bullish about the economy than the OBR. So the SFC forecasts there'll be stronger growth in revenues. The OBR forecasts, okay, the equivalent revenues in the rest of the UK won't grow as strong. Mm. And therefore, the block grant adjustment won't grow as much. So what initially happens is the Scottish government, in this scenario, it kind of says, well, hey, the tax revenues are going to go up more than the block grant adjustment. We've got this extra money to spend. Now, come the end of the year, when they've kind of finally calculated things, it turns out, well, no, actually, in the end, there wasn't different performance. It was just different expectations, just different forecasts. And then later on, that's, that money that they thought they had, that's just kind of, if you like, um, it, it, it's an artifact of, of one forecast being more bullish than the other. And down the line, the Scottish Government have to pay that money back to the UK government because, in the end, revenues didn't grow more quickly in Scotland. Okay. Although now, it's... What I'm saying is that when you have these two different forecasters, you have a greater likelihood of different judgments being taken by, by those than if you have one forecaster doing everything. So having two forecasters that make different judgments on different sides of the budget... The, the revenue side and then the block grant adjustment side, that adds a bit more noise and a bit more volatility, and you need borrowing powers and reserve powers to deal with that. If you're happy to do that, then having the more bespoke forecasts might be considered um, a good thing. On the other hand, if, you, if, if the idea of basically potentially having these errors and then having to kind of pay money back down the line is concerning, then actually you could do the Welsh route, and the Welsh route is at the moment to have the OBR do both sides of forecasting, the, the, the revenue and economic forecasts and the block grant forecasts. So Scotland and Wales have chosen different routes on this. Okay, I mean, it's worth saying that we, ha we at the minute, you may be aware, we have, a, in terms of block grant adjustments, we have probably one of the most egregious examples of it in the UK, where because of, I presume, a forecast done by the OBR a decade ago, um, we are paying out £2.5 million pounds a year for a theoretically reduced long-haul air passenger duty rate, which must be... A, actually, if you're not aware of it, David, honestly, go away. Please go away and do some work on it. It is one of the most um, pathetic examples of forecasting around uh, a bit of fiscal devolution. Anyway, um, the other um, question I wanted to ask you was, um, uh, you know, so there are sort of variations within the UK examples um, of, uh, as it were, fiscal advisory bodies. The... I guess the other broad model that doesn't really exist in the UK is the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, which has a much more 
uh, sort of expansive role as a non part highly specialized non partisan um, uh, you know expert body at, at a time whenever it was U- U.S. politics is hyper partisan and very divided, and and that's sort of quite a treasured position. Um, I, I, just you, it would be interesting to get your thoughts on the CBO uh, model and how it might um, uh, how it compares favorably or otherwise to um, the various models that the U- in the UK. Yes, so I think you know I think the OECD probably talked about this in the evidence session. It's been kind of if you like two broad types of models of independent fiscal institutions. There's sort of the fiscal council type model, like the OBR, like the Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, like like many others. Uh, and then there's the sort of parliamentary budget office uh, type model, um, which tends to have a somewhat different role and is focused less on, if you like, you know, kind of forecasting and long run sustainability and policy costing of government policy and more providing, if you like, um, a, a supporting the scrutiny and policy development function of of uh, parliaments. Um, now, I think there's nothing you know stopping you know actually having you know hybrid, uh, hybrid or both of these uh, of these options. Um, I, I think my own personal view would be that when setting up a body um, that uh, would be a new body in a especially in a sort of setup where there potentially is i guess constitutional or political friction around around significant areas of policy having a relatively narrow remit which is more clearly apolitical i think would allow that body to establish itself gain credibility and then over time as that public is gained, you can think about adding functions to it, which expand its scope. And, you know, whilst avoiding, if you like, policy development and comment on particular policies, start to get closer towards, you know, I guess the more contentious political aspect of it, like, you know, you know so that the CBO, for example, or CPB in Netherlands would look at, you know, policy platforms of, 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 of different parties and, you know, impact on the distribution impacts on employment, so on and so forth. Those things are going to be inherently, you know, more controversial, even if they're done, you know, in a very impartial, sort of independent, rigorous way. So I think my view on that would be that there's nothing stopping, you know, any part of the UK or any country at all, sort of, you know, having hybrid or having both sorts of models in place. But starting off, I'd start off limited on areas where you can kind of build credibility, build a reputation, and then think about expand it over time okay, okay but then one final one final comment following on from that is whether or not you then expand it into a kind of parliamentary budget cbo style thing and um i'm sure the political parties the very high quality political parties in northern ireland would be more than happy to have our extremely high quality um manifesto subjected to independent <laughs> fiscal scrutiny i'm sure they'd all add up really convincingly um but uh Sorry, that was just guffaws of laughter in the uh, corner there my the, the question i was um, we're going to ask is on this question of you know independence. Um, you know, you talked about the constitutional issue, not the not the not the the, 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 the constitutional issue that we um, uh, worry about here in Northern Ireland habitually, but the, the constitutional issue of the, the kind of institutional friction between a devolved finance ministry, which will always have an interest. So, if part of the role of the fiscal council is going to be to um, to create a repository of independently trusted analysis and information that will smooth uh, and regularise certain types of processes between a devolved finance ministry and a, a kind of UK level finance ministry which um, uh, doles out the block grant like how do you th- where should what should be the legal character and independence of that organisation clearly there's a risk on both sides one that it looks like it's operating as a kind of homework that is marking homework on behalf of the UK government, or it's there to be an overseer of um, devolved institutions, which are, um, uh, you know, um, uh, devolved and, and, and should be independent. Uh, or, on the other hand, that it's simply a, um, you know, it's it's ballast for the devolved finance ministry making, you know, making its arguments. So I'm just interested in your view of how do you best, Im- like, uh, ensure it has uh, independence from both sides, as it were, um, not. 
primary legislation is obviously mm-hmm. one part of that, but I'm just interested to see how you think, like, and do you think, for example, the Scottish and Welsh systems have that? Do you think, for example, it, is there any uh, sense that the UBR are doing forecasting and, you know, having the fiscal advisory rule in Wales is any um, uh, compromises its independence from, uh, from, from Whitehall, or is that just your thoughts on that would be interesting? So on, on, on that last point, um, my sense is that um, <laughs> my sense is that the Welsh government sort of took a practical sort of decision about what they felt would be not only sort of most sort of cost effective, but would also, as I said, like limit potentially some of the fiscal risks that arise from having two sets of forecasts that might differ and therefore you need some sort of reconciliation down the line between them. So both kind of to save save resources, given, I think, uh, not just kind of financial resources, but kind of maybe potentially some concerns about, I guess, human resources. Um, but then also this kind of, you know, volatility point, a, a decision was taken in Wales that at least for a period um, that the, the OBR would be a suitable um, uh, sort of uh, forecaster. I think actually for a short while they they were doing internal forecasts, which had been sort of then vetted uh, by Bangor University. Um, so that was another sort of model that they can consider, you know, sort of like you know government forecasts, but with a peer review. And I think some IFIs actually operate on that basis. They, rather than actually producing the official forecasts, they operate as a sort of a peer reviewer uh, of, of government forecasts. So that's a another model. Um, in Scotland, I think the SFC has done a remarkably good job in what is a very uh, politically contentious um, area, but I think that's probably been partly because of its quite narrow remit. The remit is sort of extended to sort of uh, look at um, issues, you know, just in terms of medium-term forecasts on what will happen to revenues, uh, what will happen uh, to uh, spending on these demand-led welfare measures. What are the policy costings of, 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 of policies? And a sort of a pretty soft touch, sort of like, is the government's, you know, um, uh, policy on uh, capital and uh, resource um, uh, borrowing and the reserves sort of sustainable? Um, I think if it had been a broader remit, also considering things like effectiveness of long-term efficiency measures, uh, the sort of medium to long-term sustainability of the budget, I think that would have potentially become more politically contentious. Um, you know, uh, you could see it, you could, you could see it sort of, you know, becoming battlegrounds between, you know, uh, the sort of opposition parties in the government around issues to do with effectiveness. Um, you could see the sustainability issue becoming a battleground between the, the sort of Scottish government and the UK government around issues such as, you know, well, how are we going to address, you know, the, the long-term rising costs of, of health and of social care and, and other issues and, oh, look, they're not giving us enough money to, to pay, for these, pay for these things. I think that whilst that sort of work is, is really important, again, I'm not sure if I was starting off trying to get kind of credibility and independence of a, of a, of a new body, I would immediately jump into those somewhat more controversial areas. Um, so I, I've answered part of your question there on the kind of like second, like who, who it reports to and how you kind of, um, you avoid it seeing, being seen as a kind of a stooge of either parties. Um, I think part of that is just, you know, starting off with a kind of a focused, a focused remit, which is as apolitical as possible to kind of build that credibility. I think part of it is making sure that, um, that the, the body is. I don't think I, I don't think the body can be directly accountable to two parliaments, but I think it should interact with two parliaments and should be sort of you know willing to give evidence and you know able to give evidence to both the UK Treasury Select Committee and other subject committees and the Northern Irish Assembly committees. Also, ha- making sure there's agreements between um, the. Uh, the f- sort of fiscal council and not only Northern Irish institutions in terms of like accessing data, but also uh, UK institutions where they need to get data from UK departments like HMRC and, and so forth. So um, 
I think there will need to be kind of memorandum of understanding and, and so on and so forth with a lot of UK government uh, departments as well as with the Northern Irish uh, Assembly. I, I guess I would also kind of just, just, just caution, I guess, many of the things that would, would want to be done here, for example, on, you know, the sort of effectiveness of long-term efficiency measures, the, the medium-term sustainability of the, the, Scot of the, of the Northern Irish um, budget, uh, so on and so forth, those need to be looked at. I'm just not sure, at least in the first instance, a fiscal council is the right body to look at those and whether instead, for example, the Northern Ireland Audit Office or the equivalent uh, that exists in Northern Ireland, or actually the Northern Irish executive itself uh, looks at this. So in terms of medium term sustainability, I think the Scottish government's, you know, it's got its medium term financial strategy, which is moving in the direction of looking at kind of medium term sustainability, fiscal risks and so on. Um, because that then becomes somewhat more political and, you know, it, it, maybe actually having something done by the government is the correct... Thanks, David. I'm, I'm so, David, I'm just cautious that time's running on and we've got two other sort of people to come in. Jim, uh, Jim Allister. A practical question, uh, if you give us a brief answer. Uh, <laughs> in the last year, uh, OK, it's been a, an unusual year, but we had, obviously, with the various... Um, Treasury handouts and COVID and the Barna consequentials, it resulted in spurges of expenditure, particularly towards the end of the financial year, where the imperative seemed to be get it spent without too much scrutiny of, of what the return on it was. What difference would a fiscal council have made? So in that context, I do not think, you know, so the Fiscal Council would have no role in determining the uh, UK uh, government's funding for, for the Northern Irish Executive. So it wouldn't no, affect... I'm, I'm interested in the executive spend of it, not the, the gifting of it to them. Right. So uh, in general, a Fiscal Council would not be commenting upon the use of, of funding for particular policies uh, given the fact that kind of then starts to impinge upon policy and, you know, get it into more political grounds. So I think, you know, where a, a fiscal council uh, can play a, a useful role here is, is less in terms of the spending control and kind of critique of that. I think that is more of a role for an audit office type body or the parliaments, actually. Um, where I think a fiscal council can play a, a useful role there is making sure that there's public understanding about what is happening on on the sort of um, the funding situation. So one of the things that the Scottish Fiscal Commission did very well was actually put out information about, you know, how much funding has the Scottish government got? When has it been received? You know, actually, how much is it carrying forward into next year? Where is this money being allocated to? So I, I think I think it, it, can, it can serve a role as an information body, both for the public and for parliaments. But I don't see that as really addressing... Uh, that that particular concern. I mean, I think one thing I would add is that I think this concern is probably actually lesser uh, in the devolved countries, given the additional flexibilities the Treasury gave to the devolved governments to carry forward funding that didn't exist in um, in, in in England. So I think actually, you know, when you look at, for example, health spending, it looks like that that, that health spending there was sort of you know a substantially smaller splurge on, on that in the devolved governments, particularly towards the end of the year, because they could carry forward some of the budget, which, which couldn't happen in England, it was lost. So short answer, I don't think it would solve that problem, but it can play an information role. OK, thank you. OK, thanks very much. Alicia? Welcome uh, here this afternoon too. And uh, just quickly, I know it appeared funny earlier on there, but uh, would it not actually be a good thing if uh, the Fiscal Council had a role in uh, the costing of political parties' manifestos and the likes of it? Uh, so that um, uh, they'd actually be forced then to, i.e. the parties and so on, to ensure that they're using uh, accurate information when talking about uh, policies or what it is that they intend to implement uh, in the event of being elected. So I think there can be real benefits from that approach. I think you're right that, you know, it's important that parties, uh, you know, are subject to scrutiny on their on their plans, both in terms of their overall affordability, but also the kind of stated impacts they say they'll get, whether it's in terms of the distribution or in terms of the likely effects on the economy and so on and so forth. So I can I can definitely see see benefits of that. You know, the kind of prime example 
of that is the CPB in the Netherlands, which, you know, I think, I think it's since the 1980s, they've been, um, you know, um, it's all on a voluntary basis, I should say, but basically all the parties now do submit their manifestos to CPB who produces a report looking at, you know, the impact on, you know, revenue, spending, jobs, distribution, so on and so forth. Now, I think there can be some drawbacks to that approach as well. Um, I think the first drawback kind of comes back to, again, this point that when an institution is new and in, in working in a sort of uh, uh, potentially divisive political or, or otherwise, you know, landscape, actually getting into this, getting into this area can, can sap some of its sort of political capital. Um, I think, I think, I think, I think that, that can be a risk. Um, I think the second issue is that the, the, there would need to be a very, very clear uh, understanding about the uncertainties involved in some of this. So I think, um, you know, I work at, I, at the IFS, and the IFS does some of this type of analysis for UK policies. I'm not sure we always get across, as well as we could, the uncertainties about some of this stuff. But I think, again, using this kind of CPB model, the sort of Dutch model, um, you know, a manifesto will come out and they'll analyze it and it will have 20,000 jobs as a sort of figure on it. Another manifesto might have 25,000 jobs. However, in economic analysis, the sort of range of uncertainty around those figures is, is, is quite a lot greater than those 5,000 difference in jobs. So I guess the kind of point I'm raising there is that, is that I think if if a sort of body went down the route of sort of doing kind of comprehensive analyses of party manifestos, it would need to be very clear about the uncertainties, the limits of its knowledge, um, and you know, again, maybe kind of start off with kind of a small set of things it looks at, like potentially costs and basic distribution analysis, and then over time as it embeds, it builds its it builds its you know expertise, it builds understanding about these issues, then start to do more complicated analysis, making sure it explains the uncertainties around it. Because I think there can be, you know, as an economist, maybe I shouldn't say this, but there can be almost like too much focus on on some of some of the sort of like quantitative estimates when actually some of this stuff, there's quite wide uncertainty and sort of confidence intervals around it. So I think, it, I think that would be something to bear in mind. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, Malisha. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your evidence, David, and thank you very much indeed for coming along. And that's been very informative and it's been very useful. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. And if we move on to the next uh, evidence session, it's uh, oral evidence from Carnegie UK Trust Public Sector Reform. And it's Jennifer Wallace, who's Head of Policy for Carnegie UK Trust. Uh, the session has been recorded by Hansard. Briefing notes on page 214. A written submission is at page 220. And a submission by the Trust to the Consultation of the Programme for Government is page 226. Can we bring Jennifer into the spotlight? Hi, Jennifer. Can you hear us? I can. Excellent. OK, thank you very much. Could you make your opening statement, please? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Um, so I am delighted to be here with you um, in your consideration of public sector reform. Um, I'm aware that you've had a very busy afternoon, and therefore I will uh, make some remarks, but, but leave the bulk of time for questions um, so that we can get into some of the detail of the submissions that the Carnegie UK Trust has made. As you will see from our previous work, of course, um, we've been working with colleagues in Northern Ireland now since about 2013 on concepts around wellbeing approaches. Um, so thinking particularly about how public sector reform can be used to improve outcomes for the people who live in, in Northern Ireland. And with that, we've been really leaning on uh, not only our work in Northern Ireland, but also work in Scotland, work with colleagues in Wales, um, some work at a regional level in England, and international analysis and connections with the OECD. So we have a a large back catalogue um, of research on, on which we're trying to rest our comments and, and our exploration of the issues in Northern Ireland at this present time. 
So given that background and, and that perspective, I think it's really important to stress at the outset just how important and transformative the outcomes-based approach in 2016 was um, when it uh, appeared in the draft programme for government. And the signal that was being given then about the understanding of the nature of the interconnectedness of different domains of people's lives and the need for government to understand how we all live our lives in the round and how we are all connected. And that really is a step forward. In our understanding of that, um, and, and in some of our more academic work, we see that as a shift between what we do understand as the, uh, the important benefits of a new public management approach um, and a shift towards taking the best learning from new public management, but placing it in a context that allows us also to lean on concepts of sustainable development um, and, in our language, concepts of sustainable um, and societal well-being. So there is a general shift um, internationally away from new public management and into the logic of public sector reform that understands outcomes um, and, and tries to change some of the narratives around what we're trying to achieve as societies. So my analysis of the shift that Northern Ireland is then part of goes into that international concept of how you build a well-being government. And as you may know, there are leaders in the field in uh, well-being government. So uh, Scotland and Wales being well known, New Zealand, um, perhaps slightly less known uh, is Iceland and its work. Um, and then also coming up, of course, um, we've got Finland and, and interest in Canada as well. So there's a growing international movement um, trying to embrace a well-being approach to, to governance. And what you can see from these, while they use different language and different frameworks, um, is that by and large, they have six key components. And I think you can begin to see some of the conversations that you've been having about public sector reform understood within, within that context. So I just give you the six different um, aspects of public sector reform. The first one is that there is a, an overarching vision. Uh, a view of social progress and, and societal progress is above the level of day-to-day -day politics, something that everybody can get around the table on. Um, and that's where some of the leadership concepts come in. There's an outcomes-based performance measurement system that underpins that, that takes uh, on board social, economic, environmental and democratic indicators so that you get that basket of what social progress actually means for a given area. You then have concepts, really important concepts of horizontal integration, so that's joined up <coughs> government between departments and mechanisms to try to improve joined up working. Um, now that's not to say that there aren't still important roles for departments and, and important places for silos to exist, but just that there's also a layer at which it all comes together and becomes more than the sum of its parts at a governance level. There's then the parallel of that with vertical integration, where there's a golden thread and a connection between the centre and the local, um, and usually um, sort of mechanisms for measuring um, and, and connecting up through performance management systems there. And two other fundamental shifts that go within the bucket of wellbeing approaches. Um, the first one is prevention shifting upstream to stop harms from happening so that you are reducing failure demand on public services. And then participation, uh, understanding that well-being can't be done to people, that it can only be done with, with people, um, with their active involvement and with their consent. So my analysis of how far Northern Ireland is on that trajectory is a few years out of date now. So I noticed that uh, you had invited the OECD back in, and I think uh, certainly Carnegie UK Trust and other stakeholders will be very interested to hear what they have to say on that. Um, no, we, 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 we as a committee invited them back in. The government hasn't. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Um, but, but that role is, is incredibly helpful. Um, and and uh, again, they will be able to put that into the context of the international shifts and, and the movements that they're very familiar with. Um, so, so helpful connection there with that global and international shift on well-being. So I have outlined in the document sent to you the recommendations that we have made in terms of um, where we think the programme for government, the draft programme for government currently is and some of the changes that we would make. And I don't want to go through all of those for time reasons, but I do want to just spend two, two minutes just talking about the, the need to put the, um, the outcomes-based approach or the outcomes on a statutory footing. Because we think that it's quite critical to some of the confusions in Northern Ireland about what the outcomes-based 
or the wellbeing approach is. Um, so in, in our international work, we've, we've never seen an example of the outcomes being put in the programme for government, which made us pause and, and wonder why is that and, and what is it that they're doing differently elsewhere? Um, and but, uh, sorry, we... just, just, to, just to cut across here there a second, but of course, if you look at some many other, look at the New Zealand model or other models as well, they're actually relatively small number of them which are all definable against yeah. measurable goals <laughs> and measures of effectiveness. Whereas here we have a hodgepodge of, I've forgotten how many is it, 14 with six outcomes for whatever it happens to be. And it's, they've got multiple owners for each outcome. So there is, one of, the, one of the questions I was going to ask you, but I'll ask you to it now, is you know, compared to our programme for government and outcomes based approach, particularly based around wellbeing, but it doesn't. It seems to be diffuse. It seems to cover every sort of angle and outcome, whereas other um, outcomes-related and well-being-related sort of um, programs are very narrowly focused, with deliverable levels against it. And sort of, you could actually understand yeah. it in one sheet of A4 rather than yeah. half a rainforest, is what we've managed to produce. Yeah. Yeah. So if I if I answer that question, which in part is what I was what I was hoping to get across to you in this sense that the um so so there are in the the wellbeing frameworks there are different levels at which they're operating. So in the statistical level, in the build up of the domains of wellbeing, those are by and large covering the same things. Now, they will do them in different ways. So um, in Wales, I think you have six of them. There are more in Scotland, more in Northern Ireland, as you've described. Um, but generally, they're covering in, in different language the same domains of well-being. So they're all holistic in that way. What is different when you get into a programme for government is that programme for government activity is then selecting down within those domains into the key actions that those governments are going to take in order to improve well-being. So they don't put all of the outcomes within the programme for government. What they do is they have a separate place for that, whether that's in Treasury documentation or whether that's in legislation, as in Scotland and in Wales. So it exists in a separate policy entity and then for the program for government what they do is they pull out what they're going to do in the short and medium term connected to those outcomes absolutely but not giving the entirety of it right does okay. that does that help so they're, they're narrowing down i mean usually what they would do is they would identify areas of real concern to well-being so if you look at um, new zealand for example they're looking there at mental health and that obviously has a direct read across to um to northern ireland um, so so they would be saying well okay what can we do here to improve mental health but not look at it as a health outcome look at it as a cross-government issue and then identify programs that work across government to improve mental health yeah because i noticed when your recommendation for and i think one of the key things about it is you know aligning budgets with outcomes which, of course, is one thing we have never done, because everything in Northern Ireland we're stovepiped into departments that cascades down. So when you look at when we hear people talk about the cross-cutting approach and sort of an outcomes-based approach to doing it, well, that sort of falls at the first hurdle. So what would the recommendation be, therefore, about how do we align budget outcomes? And again, this ties in the conversation we've already been having today about a fiscal council and a fiscal commission. Oh. And particularly looking at how we sort of shape our sort of program for government. And one of the things that I've always been concerned about is we've had a program for government, but again, without any measurable output from it or lines of budgetary authority, all it is is paper. So I think um, in terms of what a well, so first thing to note, there is no agreed uh, definition of what a wellbeing budget is. Um, so we have, as the best examples, the, the New Zealand budget. Now, what they have done is take a portion of their budget from departments and allocated it into joint funds for wellbeing projects. They have not delivered, and I think they would accept this, they've not delivered a full budget aligned to outcomes. And we would right. not be expecting any government to do that in, in one fell swoop. That is a, a long process of change that will take a good number of years. Um, we've been experimenting in Scotland on whether instead of doing it by identifying the, you know, a, a small number of core issues that you want to handle, for example, domestic violence or mental health, whether you can do it by population age group. 
So for Scotland, we were interested in whether or not you could have a look across the very earliest years of people's lives. So the um, preconception to age three, where there actually is an awful lot of joined up working that's required to support um, families and young children at that time. And look at that part of the budget um, and take it out and say, well, can we, can we apply well-being to this in order to improve outcomes? Um, but there's no... N- no government that we can point to at the moment who has what we would consider to be a full well-being budget and that's certainly not what we would think would be the next step for Northern Ireland. It's the way of how you can begin to make those steps by better aligning in a number of different ways. Yeah, and just a sort of final question before I ask anybody else to come in. Um, obviously in Northern Ireland we have a five-party mandatory coalition and uh, one of the differences between that is obviously in Scotland where it has a single government who make the decision or even if it does have governmental partners, it's very clear that they're they're speaking off the same sort of uh, process and what they're likely to do. But one of the things we have, of course, is that um, we can't form our programme for government until the executive has been formed with the particular parties in it, with the balance it is to do that, trying to achieve that. So, you know, is there any, and because we're probably a fairly unique situation, um, how can we make it work with mandatory coalitions? Because that is... You know, unless we all agree to very high power, high level processes to begin with, just so that civil service <laughs> can start working on these ideas, we're always going to be behind the power curve because nothing's going to be achieved until we're actually in. And to try and achieve a proper functioning program for government in two weeks during the government form- formation is not a not not a recipe for outcomes based governance or well being either. <laughs> So we would recommend taking it out of that programme for government machinery um, and locating it uh, elsewhere within your policy uh, machinery. And and you can, as I say, you could put that in um, finance machinery. So in our response on the the budget bill, we were noticing the uh, potential opportunities for changing some of that and better aligning on on that basis. Um, But our strongest recommendation is to put it in legislation so that it exists separate to the the ongoing um, political conversations that need to happen. and to be very clear, we see no um, political arguments about what should be in a well-being framework. These are, are universal uh, human needs to a large extent. Um, the the politics comes into how you deliver on them, and that will remain the role and the correct place for a programme for government. But if you can separate those two functions out, it gives a direction of travel and a clarity, not just to the civil service, but also to um, third sector, to academics and uh, to, to other partners who are working on social change in Northern Ireland, that that direction of travel will not alter um, in, in its entirety, even though the mechanisms for how you reach it will change depending on the political complexion. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Any members wish to come in? Oh, Jennifer. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your evidence. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, If we move on to item number nine on the agenda, written briefing, Department of Finance, Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme. Uh, The committee will now consider a written briefing from the Department on the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme Amendment Scheme, Northern Ireland 2021, led on the Assembly on the 23rd of April 2021. Relevant uh, papers are at page 253. The Department has made an amendment scheme for the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme. The scheme removes an erroneous reference to the annual accruing superannuation liability charge and is to have retrospective effect from 1 April 2014. The Committee considered a draft of the scheme on 21 April 21 and was content on the basis that the changes were purely technical in nature and conferred no disbenefit on pensioners. The Department advises that the scheme does not deviate from the draft. PC, PCSPS rules are not statutory rules and have no associated Assembly procedure, but must be laid in the Assembly. Therefore, are members content to note the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme Amendment Scheme Northern Ireland 2021 laid in the Assembly on the 23rd of April 2021? Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. If we move on to subordinate legislation, small business rates relief. The Department has made a statutory rule under Article 31C of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977. Relevant papers are at page 261. The rule will continue the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme until 31 March 2022. The scheme provides relief of between 50 to 20 per cent for businesses with rateable values less than 15,000. The Committee agreed that it was content that the related SL1 on 21 April 21. 
The Department advises that the statutory rule does not deviate from the original uh, SL1. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure and is to come into effect on 30 April 2021. This will be in breach of the 21-day rules indicated by the examiner and statutory rules at page 8 of the tabled items. The Department advises that the rule is needed to ensure the legislative basis for the issuing of rates bill. Okay. Are all members in the spotlight? You need to be. Yep. Therefore, if we are content, therefore, if we're content um, that the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule SR 2021-111, the Rates Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. 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 Members are also asked to consider pages 7, 8 and 9 of the tabled items, which gives the examiner of statutory rule commentary and statutory rules 86 to 89, which were laid in breach of the 21-day rule. The examiner of statutory rules also comments on, on these same rules and highlights a drafting error. Sp specifically, each rule fails to indicate that FM and DFM acted jointly in the respect of the Financial Assistance Act, Northern Ireland 2009. The Department has undertaken to amend the drafting error at the earliest opportunity. Are we content to note the Examiner of Statutory Rules report? Noted. Noted. Thank you. Moving on to correspondence. Correspondence index. Members are asked to note the index of the 16 received items of correspondence at page 271. Item 11.2, uh, the PAC memo on the managing the central government and the state report. Members are asked to note a memo from the Public Accounts Committee at page 275 advising that it has relinquished primacy over the NIAO report managing the central government of state. The report has already been considered by the committee. Are members content to note? Mm -hmm. note. Uh, next item, investing activity report, April 21. Members are asked to note at page 276 the latest investing activity report from the department. The report highlights the department has a limited number of capital projects, most of which are based on the RPM programme. Are members content to note? note. Agreed. Uh, uh, next item, Departmental Response on COVID for the Community and Voluntary Sector. Members are asked to note at page 279 a copy of a response from the Department to the Committee for Communities, indicating that the Department has no way of differentiating the recipients of any of the grants to identify which are voluntary and community groups. Uh, anybody wish to comment on that? Okay. Are we content to note the correspondence? Content. Great. <laughs> Uh, Departmental response on the sale of Port of Eau Reservoir. Members are asked to note at page 280 a copy of the response from the Department of the Committee for Infrastructure. The response states that land and property services indicated that the sale price was as expected for land of that quality. Well, like gosh, I wish I could pick up an estate that size in a reservoir for that sort of money. I, I just, I mean, as I say, it's not my constituency, but I have been following Facebook postings by a lot of aggrieved local residents. And they're just aghast. This is a prime site. Remember, this is North Down. This is absolute. Well, I'm a bit careful what I say, but North Down is not the poorest part of Northern Ireland. Uh, and therefore, um, for, for that extent of land to be sold for such a knockdown price amazes me. But you know, who am I as a humble, obscure backbencher to, to, to contest that? But I just, I'm, I'm genuinely surprised. Well, two things. I'm genuinely surprised. And second, you're neither humble, humble or obscure, Jim. I think we know that. Is anybody any other comments? Uh, well, sort of uh, having taken uh, um, having taken note of uh, Member Wells's comments, and the rest of it. Aside, Sorry, Gemma. Jim, no, Jim. Oh, Jim. Yeah, Chair. Um, I just want to endorse that view. I find it quite astounding that. Um, property of this scale and potential has been disposed of at that level and I do seriously question whether it was value for money to the public purse. Uh, I thought it needs a bit more explaining than what we've got. Yeah. Um, the other issue of course is as a piece of valuable real estate as we would imagine in North Down if the reservoir, for some reason, found itself mysteriously drained, it would could be a quite a, sub, a substantial uh, site um, for potential future development as well. Um, could I have a? I would like to write again to I think it's LPS 
to ask them to uh, again critically look at sort of the valuation of the land and the sale of the land. Uh, yes, and to do that as well. Could I have a seconder? Oh, absolutely. Jim. Okay, Jim Wells. Also, if you ask about the number of reservoirs sold under these circumstances. Yes, can we also? I think it'd be appropriate if we ask the question of the number of other reservoirs that have been sold under these circumstances, because this may indeed be somebody who's looking as an opportunity here. Are we content? Great. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item of the department response: nearly zero energy buildings. Members are asked to note at page 284 correspondence from the Department providing follow-up information to its oral briefing on the 14th of April 21 on nearly energy zero buildings. The Department states that its current modelling of the proposed uplift of 25 to 40 per cent would appear to reduce the extent of new homes operational emissions by around 1.3 to 2 uh, kiloton CO2 per year for year one and further annual savings ongoing. Are we content to note? Noted. Uh, next item of the uh, correspondence from Kingspan, Kingspan Insulation Limited, uh, technical support and advice note. Members are asked to note at page 293 correspondence from Kingspan Insulation Limited, providing the committee with a copy of its recently published advice note regarding K15 insulation product. Kingspan says that it has the confidence that K15 made in the UK from June 2010 onwards displays the same fire performance as current K154. This accounts for approximately 85% of all K15 sales between 2006 and 2018. Kingspan goes on to say that between 2006 and May 2010, there were a number of changes in the formulation and manufacturing process used to make K15. It is undertaking independent testing for product produced throughout this time period, which will be complete in eight months' time. Kingspan indicates that where it recommended K15 for use in a particular building, and the existing suite of British Standard 8414 tests does not support that use, then it is fully committed to evaluating what action is required and to providing remediation where appropriate. Would any members like to comment, Paul? Okay. Content to note? Agreed. Okay. Uh, ministerial response to Community Renewal Fund. Members asked to note at page 299 a copy of a response from the Finance Minister to the Committee for the Economy and the Community Renewal Fund. The Minister voices his concerns for potential misalignment between the CRF and its successor, the Shared Prosperity Fund, and the Executive's Programme for Government. The Minister also highlights his concerns that the delivery structure for CRF and SPF use the UK Internal Market Act in a way which bypasses the Executive to new detached structures operating from Whitehall. Are we content to note? Noted. Uh, Department response uh, appointment of interim per permanent secretary. Members are asked to note at page 301 a response from the department explaining the department's selection process for an interim, interim permanent secretary and advising that Colin Boyle will take up his position and the role of accounting officer in May on a date still to be agreed. This interim temporary prom promotion arrangement will be in place for three to six months. Clark has asked the Department if Mr Boyle might accompany officials to the departmental briefing on the business plan on June. Are we both content to note and extend our invitation to Mr Boyle? Yes, um, Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, but my question is, can we have a... The, the last line says, work is underway to progress an open recruitment exercise to fill the post on a substantive basis by the summer, um, just not entirely clear when, I mean, I, I suppose that's relatively um, specific, but it, when is the summer? Well, on, up, until the summer? Tw up until the 21st of September, I would. Uh... So, I mean, it would just be helpful to understand uh, a little bit more about when um, the, the advertisement's going out and to whom and et cetera, et cetera. We'll raise that issue with the DALO until rather than formally writing, we'll ask yeah, it's just, specifically it, I just think it would be helpful to understand. I mean, if, if work is underway, has a, you know, just as an advertisement been drawn up, where will it be advertised, et cetera, et cetera, what role the civil service commissioner, if any, would play? Yeah. Uh, next item, uh, departmental response, use of red diesel for pleasure boats. Uh, I make a disclosure here as a next member of the Royal Navy. I do know something about boating and maritime activities. 
but I'm not quite sure what non-propulsion use of red diesel means. This will become apparent when I read this. Members are asked to note on page 303 a further response from the Department on the Chancellor of the Chequers recent statement on the use of red diesel for pleasure boats. Treasury officials have advised that private pleasure craft users in Northern Ireland will no longer be able to use red diesel for propelling their craft from no later than June this year, with the specific date to be confirmed in due course. The Treasury have advised that the UK Government is to introduce a new relief scheme in Northern Ireland to ensure the average private pleasure craft user in Northern Ireland does not pay a higher rate of duty on their non-propulsion use that they pay now. Um, I am completely baffled by what non-propulsion use means, (laughs) unless it means running a standby generator when the the boat is alongside or the vessel is alongside, but I find that... I don't really understand that. Well, that's absolutely ludicrous because if they were running a generator, does that mean when they stop the generator, they drain the entire tank, they put in the clear diesel, and then they run the boat, and then that night they drain the tank and then put the red diesel back in? Or do they have two tanks? I think we need clarity in this one, don't we? Is this, no. is this public sector creeping into the private sector and leisure time? Bureaucracy? <laughs> <It's> worse. <laughs> We might ask the new Minister of the Economy in a few weeks to sort that one out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, assuming, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're assuming? Jim, do you want to come in there? Yes, I want to come in. Yeah. Me, you addressed. Yeah. Yeah, like it's very clear what this is to me. This is a consequence of the protocol. Because of the protocol, we're so subject to a relevant EU. <laughs> court judgment, which prohibits the uh, liberty to use whatever form of diesel you wish, and whereas the rest of the United Kingdom has been able to move away from that oppressive restraint, we have been left, courtesy of the protocol, with our pleasure boat users dictated to as to what form of diesel they can and cannot use. And now the UK government say they're going to have to introduce some sort of compensation scheme To cover that, it's absolutely preposterous that, courtesy of the protocol, we are having liberties and freedom of choice in what you put in your pleasure boat, restrained, courtesy of dictatorship from Brussels. Hmm. Simple. Uh, I think I would like some, particularly like to have some clarity uh, from my own sort of nautical experience and education as well from the department. And I would like us to write to the department, ask them to explain the reference to non-propulsion use and what it actually means. Are we content? Um, I think it would be also um, useful to understand. Um, uh, so it says the UK government are liaising with representative groups covering craft users as well as fuel suppliers. Um, Who they uh, are? Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard, to leave aside the heat uh, over these issues, I haven't heard of a huge amount of um, uh, um, practical frustration over this, but if, if it would just be helpful to understand who they're liaising with, and so that that which will shed some light on the on, on the mm. practical impact and, and how people are dealing with it. Okay. South Belfast, you have private yachts rather than pleasure boats. It's, pardon me, sorry, Jim. In South Belfast, you have private yachts, not pleasure boats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, so we move swiftly on to the next item for correspondence. It's a uh, Committee of Procedures Private Members Bill. Members are asked to note at page 306 a response from the Committee on Procedures agreeing to consider this committee's request to amend standing orders to allow committees the option to include the sponsor of a private member's bill as an ex officio member of the committee during the appropriate stages of the passage of the bill. Are we content to note? No <coughs> Moving on to Ministerial Response Job Start Scheme. Members are asked to note at page 308 a response from the Minister to the Chairperson regarding £26.9 million which has been allocated for labour market interventions and which will allow the Job Start scheme to proceed. The Committee has already written to the Department seeking a further breakdown of the final budget in this regard. Are we content to note? So noted. Yeah. That's agreed. Uh, Jim, do you want to talk on item 14? Uh, 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 your AQW on civil service pensions. Members yeah, were asking. Well, go ahead. As I recall, um, we had a big discussion about this. Uh, this answer confirms that under the classic 
pension scheme, someone it seems in the civil service can work on while at the same time drawing down their pension, if I understand that answer correctly, which is a, a very nice position for some to be in. And I just wonder about the efficacy of it in terms of public um, accountability and expenditure. But it seems to be what the, the rules of the scheme allow. Jim, do you have a proposal? Not as such, uh, other than obviously if it was in this, it was in this, the, the rules of the classic scheme, it's a done deal as it were, yeah. we can't unstitch it. Yeah. I, uh, I infer from the answer, maybe we should seek clarification. Uh, is that still going to be the position under the uh, current pension scheme? Uh, there's a proposal that we write to say of this, uh, bearing in mind that this is probably is, as Jim would say, it's, it is a done deal and there's little we can do. But would it be worth us writing to the, uh, the department asking the question whether this is likely to be for future pension schemes? Yes, Mr Chairman, but just, I mean, it's a pity we didn't uh, weave this into the Assembly Member's Pension Scheme because one or two of us could have done rather well out of it. Thank you very much, but we didn't. But there have been two opportunities to actually deal with this. There was the major, I think it was the Hudson Review, the major review of pensions which occurred uh, 13 years ago, and the more recent uh, review that was initiated after McLeod. So was it that this, this nice little earner, as it were, w nobody knew about it and was just pottering along and nobody spotted it? Or did they look at it and think that they wouldn't touch it, even though they had the legislative opportunity to do so? Mm. Because the cost of this to the taxpayer, must be, for the people concerned, must be enormous. Um, I, I just, I've never come across it in any other scheme. Uh, Chair, could I make one other comment? Yep. It does say in the answer, to do so, the member must secure the agreement of their employer to partially retire. Yeah. What does that mean? And I, again, do you that's go down to four days a week, or is there some threshold? I think I'd like clarification from the department. What does it mean to partially retire? Yeah. And is there a limit of number of hours that can be worked by designation of whether you're retired or not? I mean, if, if, if it's uh, you retire to four days a week from five days a week, um, is that really a substantial enough reduction? Yeah, well, I'd like to know. And it also says pension and payment is subject to abatement provisions. What are those? What does that mean? Yeah. So obviously you'd be paying you would be paying less through your salary, so that it wouldn't affect your wouldn't affect your pension. I presume. Yeah. yeah, but again, that would be useful to get clarity on that. If we are content. Yeah. 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 Happy with that. Uh, next item: uh, EU Affair Manager correspondence from the Secretary of State Northern Ireland to the House of Lords EU Committee regarding the Peace Plus Programme. Members asked to note on page 312 a copy of correspondence from the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to the House of Lords European Union Committee regarding the Peace Plus Programme, which was transferred from BEIS to the Northern Ireland Office. The special EU programmes body SEUBP is scheduled to brief the committee on the relevant consultation in May. Are we content to note? Content. Um. A committee for the Executive Office concurrent meeting on the High Street Task Force. Mass members are asked to note at page 315 an invitation from the committee for the Executive Office to a concurrent meeting on the High Street Task Force with the committee for the Executive Office and the Committee for Economy it will be held on the 16th of June. Are members content to revise its forward work programme and amend attend this concurrent meeting? Are we agreed? Agreed, Chair. But can I go back? Sorry, we went quite quickly over the Peace Plus yep. um, point. I think this is. Um, uh, 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 sorry, um, there's just a slight lack of clarity. I wonder whether we ask to be made, to be kept uh, abre uh, you know, abreast of this because um, it's not actually clear what date he wrote to the Lords of Committee, but. Um, um, uh, uh, references is uh, a WMS in 7 September, um, which, but it doesn't give any. So there is a, a consultation, but it doesn't give any more clarity after that about when more information will be coming forward. So I just wonder if an email from the clerk to the Com Lords Committee to be asked to be kept abreast of any more developments of the in respect of Peace Plus. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the SEUPP wrote to us about this, okay. so um, there's a public consultation uh, ongoing now, the 12th, I think. Yeah. yeah, ends in May, 
Um, the plan had been for the uh, SEUPB to brief the committee and also probably the committee for the executive office right, at okay, about the same time. Um, then they go to the executive and then they go to the commission. Okay. So there's a timetable. I'll resend it to the member. That's, that's okay. That's totally okay. fine, Peter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, content, Matthew? Yeah, that's fine. Thank okay. you. Uh, move on to Minister to All MLAs 2021-22 Rate Bills and Business Grants. Uh, members are asked to note page 316 a copy of the letter from the Minister to All MLAs providing information on the issue of rates, bills and COVID support for businesses. The Committee recently passed the relatively statutory rules. LPS will brief the Committee on the 12th of May. Are members content to note? Noted. Agreed. Uh, composite request. Members are uh, asked to reconsider are asked to consider the composite request of page 319. Uh, the members content the composite request is an accurate and complete record of the committee's information request. Is this agreed? Agreed. Uh, just before we move on to any other business, Matthew, would you care to uh, report on attending the workshop this morning? Uh, I was only able to attend for very briefly, so I can't give you a fulsome update, but I suggest I will. Um, uh, uh, um, I'll go away and find out. I asked a colleague, to, someone on my team, to sit in for a bit longer, so hopefully they'll have some notes. Yeah. As a committee, are we content to get any notes on any of the information, both from Matthew and indeed from the outcomings of the workshop itself? We're content. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, any other business before we move into the Queen? Oh, sorry. Uh, date and time of the next meeting is on Wednesday, the 12th of May, at 1400 here, and we'll now go into a private session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.